the, the tabernacle. So we, we said, here's Christ, or here's in the Old Testament, here's the tabernacle with the pillar of fire at night. The Israelites, without that pillar of fire, the Israelites are in darkness, okay, all around. But that pillar of fire is there at night. So they could see the, the presence of God there with them. When we come over in, then into the New Testament, Christ as that pitched tent or that, that tabernacle amongst the Jews then in the first century, you know, that, that would physically be around him, then Christ says, I am the light of the world. Okay, so, so now we have a similar scene in the New Testament, but in the case of the New Testament, he says, I am the light of the world, and the world included the Gentiles. Okay, so that really would have angered the Jews, and, and I believe we mentioned that a little bit last week, uh, but this is where we stopped. So I want you to see the parallel then from Jesus, because you remember Jesus is God, according to John chapter 1. So that, that pillar of fire right there, you know, Jesus would be in that pillar of fire providing that light you know, to Israel of old, and now here he is in the flesh standing on two feet as the light of the world, Jew and Gentile, all around him at that time. Okay, so that's, I want, to, I want you to see that, that parallel there. Also, over in John, chapter, sorry, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. So this and it says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So not only is Jesus standing, you know, uh, like in this situation or in the New Testament, where he's standing, you know, feet on the ground, surrounded by the, the Israelites who were in darkness. Je Jesus is the light. Without, without Christ in that New Testament, the Jews are in darkness. So here he is as the light standing there. But not only that, he passes the light on to those disciples, and, and today would be the Christians who follow him. And this is one of those verses that John is saying that in this message, which we have heard from him. So the, the apostle John has heard this message from Christ. Remember, they lived together. They knew each other. And he he received the, the message from Christ, and then he goes on in, in uh, 1 John 1, 5, and he says, this is the message that we received and that we're passing on to you. So that light then passes on, and I'll, I'll touch on that here in a second. If you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, most of you can probably quote this, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So Jesus now is telling those around him, those that, that are following him, but the, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. Okay? The city set on the hill cannot be hid. And then another verse there is over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, where he says that you may become blameless and harmless Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now think about we Christians and Christians all the way back to the first century. If John wrote from Ephesus. Okay, that's part of the, the Roman Empire. Okay, he's not in Jerusalem. Right? He's, he's in Ephesus. And think about the, the Jews that lived, that were scattered out into the Roman Empire and all of the idolatry and all the other things that they witnessed in their day-to-day -day life because they were living out in the, in the Roman Empire. And, uh, and here, John in, in, uh, I'm sorry, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, then you are children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, that sounds like us today, especially what's going on in this country. Okay, so, so here we are. Light of the world, as Christ said in, in, back in Matthew that we just read, we're in the middle of this crooked and perverse generation. And look at that last part of Philippians 2.15. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Okay, so you see, you see how from the Old Testament then Christ, and we'll show one other example in a second, that pillar of fire, right? Christ is there 
you know, for, for uh, the Israelites. And then when we come over into the New Testament, Christ is here as the light of the world for Jew and Gentile, and he's, he's you know, bringing them uh, salvation, you know, basically. And then if we carry that on today as Christians, we are the light of the world surrounded by this perverse generation. We're to be like a city set on a hill, and then here it says, whom you shine like lights in the world. So you see that light, that theme of light continuing all the way from Old Testament right up to us today. So that's one thing I, I wanted to, uh, to point out there. And then finally, uh, and, and just by the way, I mentioned this earlier, but we're in chapter 8 of the Gospel of John. When you get into chapter 9, after this, there's a whole discourse about Christ being the light of the world. We'll discuss that a little bit later when we get into the discourses. But after that discourse, when you go to chapter 9, the first thing Jesus did was he healed a blind man and restored sight like that. So after this discussion of light and, and being the light of the world, he gives the blind man sight. And I thought that's very interesting, the, the way that uh, gospel unfolds. Um, then, the, then the next slide here is the burning bush. So if you turn over to um, Exodus, okay, so to be Exodus chapter 3. So let me get over there. So Exodus chapter 3. Okay, now, what I want to bring out here, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Okay, so that's what this drawing represents here, is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament refers to Christ. Okay, so here is Christ talking to Moses, right, from this burning bush. So later, when we read in John, and in, in, in later lessons, we'll get into this a little bit, John always speaks very high, sorry, uh, Christ always speaks very highly of Moses. And then also, I believe, and somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to be wrong on this, the angel of the Lord visited Abraham as well. And we'll see in discussions where Christ is talking about Abraham and the Jews will say, you're not even 50 years old yet and you say, you know Abraham. Well, yeah, yeah, he did. And when then, of course, Christ, he makes that I am statement, you know, that I am, and they get angry with him because they know what that means, that it's referring back to the Old Testament and they picked up stones to stone him. Okay, so, so anyway, in this this scene here, all the way back into the Old Testament, it says here, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. Okay, and then again, as we study, John, you'll see the people have a high regard for Moses, as, as does Christ. But this I wanted to bring out, because the angel of the Lord is a messenger of, of God. Okay, and if we think back to our first chapter, or we talked about in the beginning was the Word, so that word, and we discussed in a lot of detail what that word means, that it's the word that when Jesus spoke, he spoke the words of God. Okay, so, so then the angel of the Lord then, Christ, is a messenger from God. And if you, if you remember, uh, well, we haven't got there yet, so you wouldn't remember. But as we get there in, in the Gospel of John, we'll see that um, Christ says many times, I'm here to do the will of the Father. He'll say, it's not me that's speaking, it's it, I'm speaking for God or God is speaking through me. Like that, we'll see a lot of those verses like that. So here that angel of the Lord speaking to Moses is the same angel of the Lord, if we could say that, Christ in the flesh speaking to the Israelites in that, uh, in that first century. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of, I just wanted to show you there's a lot of um, events of the Old Testament like that that involve Christ, and there's a whole study on Christ in the Old Testament. If, if you're interested in that, uh, I would recommend you just Google that, and you'll get a lot of verses that talk about Christ in the Old Testament, but there's a whole study on that where Christ appears in the Old Testament. 
and so what I want to do is just kind of bring that over into the New Testament. What we're talking about here then is Christ, uh, you know, became flesh and stood among them. Then, you know, he brings all of that, that history with him as he's standing there speaking to them. And as the angel of the Lord there, now you have Christ in the flesh speaking to the Israelites, okay, still as a, uh, as a kind of a messenger from God. Uh, and let, let me, uh, Jim, before I get to you, let me just make sure that uh, I've gotten through them. Okay, so I've gotten through my notes on that. So, Jim, if you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, you were talking about Abraham appearing to him. Uh, if I recollect correctly, Wayne can correct me if I'm wrong on this. You know, one of three men that came to visit yes. Abraham, uh, he, you know, fed them and so on and then, before he negotiates and tells, well, before he, uh, Christ is one of the three there. Right. And before he tells him that uh, Sodom is going to be destroyed and Abraham negotiates, would you still destroy Sodom if so many righteous people were found and everything? That is spoken of as Christ being the one that he's negotiating with there. Right, that's right. And that's what I had in mind when I was when I was thinking that, but I didn't want to get too much because I forget some details sometimes. Okay, any any other questions on the this light? I've got one more slide we'll talk about. Okay, all right, and let me go to that slide. All right, so the in the Jewish mind, then Jews referred to God, or they thought of God, or the presence of God as light. If you've ever seen uh, pictures on TV or usually video on TV where the Jews are standing at the Wailing Wall uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the western wall of the temple, and they're reading, and they're, they're usually, you know, kind of bowing like that. that. That motion that they're doing like that represents the flame. Okay, that's what that's what that represents, and so they they think of the presence of God as light. In the Christian world, there are those who light a candle and say a prayer right in front of the candle because of that flame represent and the flame anyway. The flame represents the presence of God. So some people will light a candle and say their prayers in you know in front of that candle. That's what that represents. Um, if you'll turn with me then over to Psalms 119, 105. So Psalms 119, 105. And some of you can probably quote this as well. So in light of what we talked about with Jesus being the Word Okay, and the word became flesh, and, and all of that that we've talked about, and now we've talked about Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and, and all that we've talked about. Now let's read this verse from Psalms, and it probably has a little different meaning to, to it now. It says, now, uh, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now think about, in light of what we've studied about this, this I am the light of the world, and Christ being the Word. So now where he says, your Word, so that could refer to Christ. Also, if it's not referring to Christ, and you say, well, no, he's just referring to the Word of God, we've already talked about Christ being that physical, verbal Word of God when he's standing on earth speaking to the Jews. That's, that's God speaking to them. So this, your Word is a lamp unto my feet, and then he says, and a light unto my path. Takes on a whole different meaning now that we've read and studied that, what we've studied so far in John, that this light unto my path, Jesus shows the way, right? Following, following Jesus, that word that Jesus shows, he's a lamp to my path, shows me the way. Okay, another verse uh, that we can look at is over in... Um, Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah 42 and verse 6. 
So let me get over there. Isaiah 42 and verse 6. Now, this is God speaking of Christ, I believe. Okay, because if you go all the way back up, here, let's back up just for a second. Go back up to verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 42. It says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one. Okay, so this is God speaking. My elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit on him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay, so we talked about this light of the world then would include the Gentiles. Now let's drop down to verse 6 where he says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. So Christ's death, burial, resurrection, that's a covenant. I'll give you a covenant as a covenant to the people. And look at that last part of verse 6, as a light to the Gentiles. So now when we go forward into the first century, and here's Jesus standing there, and he says, I am the light, right? I am the light of the world. Now we see a little bit more about what the Old Testament was pointing towards uh, when we get over into the New Testament. And one last verse we can look at is in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 22. Daniel 2 and verse... 22. It says, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. So remember that over in 1 John that, that he is the light and in him is no darkness at all. And here Daniel tells us the light dwells with him. Okay, so that, that's just some more verses out of the Old Testament, I think, that are pointing towards Christ in the New Testament. So once we get over into John, and, and I don't know how thoroughly the Jews understood all of the, the Old Testament like that. I, I, I don't know. I guess some more than others, probably like us today as Christians, some you know read and study more than others. But I, would, I think that it can't be lost on them when Christ is there saying, I am the bread of life and I am the light of the world. That I am statement, we know they understood that because they wanted to stone him for it. And, but I, I just think it can't be lost on them, on at least some of them, when they, when they think back to the Old Testament, that old scripture, and they see Christ and hear what he's saying, how they're relating the two in their mind. I, I don't think it would be lost on them. Okay, then the last, the last point of this then is we, we mentioned uh, at the beginning that uh, John, there's, John is not only talking to the Jews who, they're not in the Holy Land, like I said, they're over in Ephesus. And so John is there, he's writing to those Jews. So, so they're living among, you know, in the Roman Empire, among the Hellenists. Those are the, the people that kind of maintain the Greek culture and, and things like that. And Greek philosophy, if you remember, we talked about the Gnostics, right, in past lessons. So not only is, is John writing to the Jews, but he's also refuting Gnosticism. So one of the pieces of Gnosticism, then, is this idea of light, that light means knowledge, okay? And, and from the Gnostics' perspective, then, Jesus claimed to be the knowledge when he says, I am the light of the world then from that Gnostic standpoint, they would understand, they would look and say, Jesus is saying that he is the knowledge, not, not some you know, uh, Greek philosophy that Jesus is saying, I am the knowledge. And anyone who did not believe in him then therefore would be walking in ignorance, right? So from, from a, just from a philosophical Greek perspective, that, would, that could be an interpretation they would have of what Jesus was saying or what John was writing about Jesus and what Jesus had said. So again, uh, I, my wife and I were talking this morning just about how, how intricate John is. That, uh, and I was thinking to myself as I was preparing to come to church, I, I don't know how smart, you know, I could say like John was a brilliant person or, or, or something like that. Uh, to me, this speaks of the inspiration of the Scripture, that John could write this gospel and it, have diff- it, it, it applies to different groups of people in different ways. And I thought, it, 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 to me, it just spoke of the inspiration of the Scripture. 
All right, so that brings us to the end of the, the I am statement that I am the light of the world. Are there any comments or questions on what we've studied so far? Okay, anything else? Now, I can't be so thorough or, or whatever that uh, no one has a question, surely. Okay, no one has a question. All right, so let's go on to the next one. All right, so let's take a look at John chapter 10 and verse 7. Okay, Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. All right, so we'll, we'll see in just a second. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and go there. So as I talk, you'll get a visual representation. Okay, can you see, so you see the, the corral or, you know, whatever you want to call it, the pen, the rock. Okay, so it's built. It contains the sheep. Do you see the shepherd sitting in the doorway right there? there's a shepherd actually sitting in that doorway right there. So here's a door, that's how you get in and out of the fold, and then there's a shepherd sitting there. Okay, so when Jesus says, I am the gate of the sheep, he's literally talking about being the gate of the sheep. Okay, so the sheep fold then is the church. So this, this fold, okay, that is the church. And the door to that church is Christ. Okay, you don't get in the in the church or or in the sheepfold without going through that shepherd or without going through Christ to get in there. Okay. The sheep are the saints. So the it's the saints are the Christians. Okay, you see you see them in that fold, okay? So that's the representation there. The sheep are the saints whom Christ leads. Okay, so Christ leads them, and, it, and we learn from Scripture that he knows them. Now, we being Christians, I'm going to say us. He knows us by our name. Okay, so as a Christian, he knows us by our name, and we follow him. Okay, that, so that's the, the dynamic there. And then, he, then the Scripture goes on, and, uh, and it says that anyone who tries to lead the sheep without coming through Christ, then he is a thief or robber stealing the sheep away from Christ. Okay, and that's in those, the scripture that surrounds. This is in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Okay, that's where I'm getting this. So if anyone tries to lead the sheep then without coming through Christ, he's a thief or a robber. He's trying to steal people away right from the church. Now, this is what I found interesting. Eastern shepherds, so over in the east, Okay, and I don't mean East United States, I mean East, like over in Eastern Europe and out East that way, Middle East, you know, out that way. Shepherds lead the sheep. If you ever go online, sometimes you'll see the, the shepherd, he's walking down the road, and there's, you know, hundreds sheep behind him like that, and they're all just following right along behind him. So in the East, the shepherds, they lead the sheep. And then, and there are some of you may know more about livestock than I do, I'm sure, uh, so there may be exceptions to this, but in the West, we drive the sheep. And one thing I can tell you from personal experience is uh, my wife and I, we used to have a, a herding dog, okay? And when he was six months old, we took him over to get his herding instinct certification. And what they do is they put sheep in a, in a livestock pen, and then you bring your dog in and you unclip him and see what he does. And our dog kind of stood there for a minute. I think he was more interested in the border collie that was laying there. But anyway, he looked up and he saw the sheep and the light came on and he said, I know what to do with these guys. And he went right after them and he drove them around the pen and then herded them into a corner. And the, the lady there who had the border collie and was kind of hosting this, she turned to me and she said, your dog is a driver. Okay, he's, not, he's not a herder like the, the border collie, would keep them all together. My dog was a driver. He would drive the sheep in a certain direction. And she said the shepherds use different dogs for different things. So anyway, that, that would be my experience within the West. We're, we're driving sheep to where we want them to go versus in the East, they lead the sheep. And it says then they know them by name. So that, that's just a, like a modern application of what John is writing here uh, in the Scripture. A stranger then cannot call the sheep away from the shepherd because the sheep do not know the stranger's voice. So if I were to walk up and say, hey, you, you know, come and follow me, that sheep would just look at me like, you know, who are you? I don't know who you are. 
So, it, so they, the sheep then do not know the stranger's voice, so they will not follow the stranger. So in John chapter 10, verse 8, because I'm in verse 8, it says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So if you remember in other, uh, I think in Acts, and maybe when we studied Luke, we talked about that there were other people calling themselves the Messiah. Okay, there, so Jesus wasn't the only one. There were other people, of course, Jesus is the Messiah, but there were others who claimed to be the Messiah, and the Romans would quickly, you know, they'd, they'd gather a few people together, like, okay, we're going to usher in the end times, and then the Romans would just say, all right, crucify this guy, and they would kill him, and then that'd be the end of it. If you remember uh, when the, um, well, the apostles stood before the Sanhedrin, and I think it was Gamaliel, and he said, hey, if this is from God, there's nothing we can do about this, but if it's not it'll go away just like all the other movements before this. Okay, if you remember that. And that's what Jesus is saying here in, uh, in verse 8, that all those who came before me, they're thieves. They're trying to rob the people away, but the sheep did not listen to them. They didn't really go anywhere. Okay, But when Jesus came as, as the shepherd, it said that he knew their name and they knew his voice. Okay, that's a whole different story. So, so anyway, uh, I mentioned that, and that was actually over in Acts chapter 5, verses 36 and 37, uh, and it was referring to Theodos and Judas. Those were the two that were named as these two other people came claiming to be the Messiah right before Christ. So that's where I got that from. Uh, so the Lord probably refers to scribes and Pharisees who, so there's a different meaning here. I mentioned there was Messiahs, uh, that, that came before Christ. But then the Lord also, when he made that statement, could be referring to scribes and Pharisees who were standing around. And um, they were trying to lead the... Um, let, let me... I've lost my place, sorry. Um, okay. And they pretended to show the way to salvation for the people, but they, in fact, stole the, the fold away and they, they clothed themselves, you know, as... As, uh, as in fleece, you know, as the, the wolf in sheep's clothing, and they devoured the sheep. So we, we know Christ's relationship with the scribes and Pharisees throughout Scripture. So, so Christ could have been referring to scribes and Pharisees as the ones leading the Jews away and not the false messiahs. So there's a couple of, you know, a couple of things there in Scripture that, that we can think about. And then also lastly, when we're talking about... Uh, Gnostics in particular, or Greek philosophy, philosophy in particular, then Christ could could mean maybe all three of these, or maybe John, as he wrote, was referring to all three of these. That Greek philosophy and these false, you know, Greek philosopher prophets or or whatever, you know, leading the people away with reasoning, you know, man's reasoning, leading people away from from God. Um, like like uh, I mentioned, the Gnostics started back in, I think it was the 4th century B.C. It was a Jewish person who started that Gnostic thinking about God, and over two centuries it grew into a huge movement, and a lot of New Testament Christians there in the early days went off and followed them. And, and basically that main tenet that they held that uh, I mentioned that applies to us is that Christ cannot be a human being and divine at the same time in the same person. That was something that they held. And if you remember, John came back and said, oh, yes, he can. We, and if we go back into John chapter 1, the first 18 verses, where he talks about the divinity of Christ, and then he steps over and says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he's showing that, yes, that they can do that. So there are three examples there for verse 8 when you say, those who came before me are thieves. Well, who is he talking about? Could be the false messiahs, could be the scribes and Pharisees, could be the Greek philosophers, or it could be all three of them that, that Christ was talking about there. Then in verse, so just back up a little bit in verse 7 then, when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, then we go back to this, go back to this, um, this picture. We see back in those days, there wasn't necessarily like we would have gates today that we would close and lock. The, the shepherd literally sat in the door. He slept in the door, right? And, and he would keep out the wolves that were trying to get in. 
hopefully they couldn't come over. But, but going back to what the Scripture was saying, if anything went over the wall, it, it didn't have good intentions. Right? And then the shepherd might go in and fight, you know, whatever that was that came over. And then likewise, he keeps the sheep, and I'm not preaching Calvinism, but he keeps the sheep from wandering out of the, you know, maybe you could say falling away or wandering out of the fold, you know. So, uh, so anyway, that when he, so when he talks about I am the door, uh, that's what he's talking about. That's a, um, I mean, that's a, like a real life representation of what a, an early uh, you know, an ancient shepherd would do. They would, they would literally set there. I've actually seen these, instead of being stone like that, they were really dense, um, put together, looked like tumbleweeds, you know, with briars and things like that, put together and formed into a, a you know, a pen like that. I've, I've seen it done that way too. I, I thought that was interesting. So Jesus literally is the door. He's the one for the sheep and the shepherds that, that come into the church. So we were talking about being baptized into Christ. Okay, we're baptized and then we are added to the church. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and then Jesus, one, one last thing here, uh, or the second to the last thing, then Jesus is the only door. There's only one door. Notice there's not multiple doors around that, that pen there. There's only one door. Jesus is the only door, okay, into it. And then the final one is in verse 9, then we see John chapter 10, verse 9, then by Christ, if any man enters in, he will be saved. This um, reminds me of something I heard uh, within the last few days. Somebody, we were talking about the church, and somebody said, well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, okay? He accepts me for who I am. Okay, that was the, the comment that, that I heard. <clears throat> and I, I thought to myself two things. One, Christ, the Bible says Christ will deliver up the church. He didn't say he's going to go around and deliver up this individual, you know, like that. It says he's going to deliver up the church to God. So anybody who's not in that fold, who's not a member of his church, is not going to be delivered up. And then secondly, when, when they said, Christ accepts me for who I am, I thought, no, he does not. Christ accepts you for where, he, they, the comment was, he accepts me, yeah, for who I am. Christ accepts you for where you are. You are in sin, and he's calling you out of that sin. He doesn't accept you in that sin in a way that he would say, it's okay, you just keep on doing what you're doing, and I understand we have a personal relationship. That's not the way that works. Christ says, I accept you for where you are and I'm calling you out of sin. I want you to be in my church. All right, so that, that's the relationship. So that just, I just heard that just over the last few days. So I, I just wanted to mention that uh, in light of verse nine here, where if any man enters in, then he will be saved. So we, we enter into the church. Okay, I've got five minutes left. Is there, are there any comments well, let me make sure I don't have anything else. Um, let's see. Well, let's see. Nope, I don't, because we're going to go into the next thing uh, the next time. Okay, anybody have any comments or questions? Jim's got the mic. Go right ahead. Well, I know you said I am the gate, but uh, the one that I thought about immediately when you were discussing that uh, relationship that we have with Christ is uh, the 23rd Psalm. You may want to... Yeah, go ahead if you want to... Well, ahead. you just think about the 23rd Psalm. Many of us, I know, can quote that. Uh, the Lord... I can sing it, but it's hard for me to quote it. <laughs> yeah, he he leads me beside still waters. He you know, prepares a table before us, and you just go through the things that the shepherd does. Yes. And it says at the very start, the Lord is my shepherd. And there are a lot of other shepherds out there, but it's not necessarily the Lord. Right, that's a good point. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay, any other comments or questions? We're talking, so far we've talked about the bread of life, we've talked about the light of the world, and we've talked about the, I want to make sure where we're going next is John chapter 10, verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Okay, so we've talked about then the door or, or the gate for the sheep, which is in verse 7, 
okay? And then next time we're going to talk about I am the good shepherd, okay? Yeah, no, that's okay. I was, I was waiting for you to say that, and I was going to say next week, next week, but we're good. Uh, but that'll be what we talk about next week, okay? So uh, this week, again, was verse 7. Next week, we'll be at verse 11. So if you, if you want to mark that, and if I get through that quick enough, we'll be in John eleven twenty five, 25, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection. So if you just want to write both of those down, just in case um, we get through it quickly, John 10, 11, okay, and then John eleven twenty five. 25. Those will be the two that we'll, we'll try to hit on next week. All right, any other comments or questions? About three minutes. I don't mind ending a little early. Okay, all right, then that's it. We'll meet again next week, and we'll keep on going. Thank you very much.